So I'm going to do a case study on North Springfield Dam. Um, it was a site characterization history or um, during the subsequent risk analyses. The history of the site characterization and how the site conceptual model changed over that time period and then what resulted um, in the uh, DSMS final study and design. So um, we're going to get into the project background and how the risk and the failure modes changed over time. So North Springfield Dam, you can see down over here, is one of 16 dams along the um, Connecticut Valley, um, the Connecticut River Valley. It's located on the Black River, approximately 8.5 miles upstream from the confluence of the Connecticut River. And then um, it's authorized, um, it was authorized for flood reduction measures back after the 38 hurricane. So here's the layout of the dam. Um, here's the main embankment. There was a cutoff trench installed during construction here, and there was another one during construction here. There's an upstream soil blanket that was also added during construction. Um, these measures down here were added subsequently, but I will get into those. Um, and then here's the outlet works and the spillway. It's a side discharge, and it flows this way. Here's the typical embankment sections in profile. Um, like many New England dams, it's an earthen embankment. Um, you can see the inclined uh, riprap surfaces. We had some issues with compaction at some of these construction interfaces due to the seasonal construction for some of the um, risk driving failure modes initially. Um, here's some of the key elevations. So we're going to go into the geology aspects of this, and the, and, the, and the geomorphology is driving the day at this dam. It really is. It's a complex ge geomorphological site with multiple layers of episodes, and so it's it's a complex site. Um, Glacial Lake, Lake Hitchcock stretched from right down here in Connecticut all the way up. It's 200 miles long into uh, upper Vermont. Um, it backed up all the tributaries in the Connecticut River Valley um, and basically increased a lot of sedimentation into those water bodies. Once the, the river, I mean, the, um, the glaciers retreated and this broke, this released all the water, you had a lot of isostatic rebound because the ice was gone and then a lot of down cutting through those sediments and that contributed to the, the geomorphology you see on the site. So uh, the bedrock is composed of gneiss and schist. The, red, uh, the right abutment is composed of an esker and gilbertite delta sequence. Here's the esker, and the delta is coming in this way from drainage this way. Uh, the left abutment is composed of uh, fluvial terraces, and you can actually see here there's, you know, terrace four, terrace three, terrace two, and terrace one. So there's four terraces over there, basically illustrating how the glacial lake was dropping and creating those terrace surfaces on the left above over time. So you can start to see a pretty complex geomorphological picture with an esker here that's highly permeable and fine sands over here. And here's the cartoon picture of the uh, geology on the site. You have a large basal till here, the esker deposit with the deltaic deposits, and then the terrace deposits up here. And then bedrock right over here. So as part of the SPRA, it was done in 2006. Um, I think it's been mentioned and come up. Those were you did five dams in a week, and you basically did one dam a day. And you had to go through every, every aspect of the dam in a day and then write up all the risk driving failure modes. It was a grind. It was, it was pretty crazy. Um, and by the end of the week, you were thinking five different dams all in your head. It, it, it got nutty. Um, but we had to sort and stack through that process and see which ones were primarily driving risk. This, in 2017, went through a periodic assessment. Um, 
2006, the main risk driver was through the esker on the right abutment. The periodic assessment was done and um, in 2017, and it was, I think, a DSAC 2. And then we did a, started a semi-quantitative or an IES risk assessment here. And we got, well, started as an SQRA, moved into a field investigation to an IES, did the quantitative assessment in 2020, and then a dam safety modification study in 2021. So here's the history of the site characterization. I want to uh, re recognize people. We have some people who are actually on the site drilling, Jen and Brent, they were both out there on the site. Um, so you're gonna see some of their work. So we did, here's some of the uh, site history. The design memo actually, it's pretty interesting. If you go back through it, we'll see it. But Omaha District did the design. The construction was completed in 1960. Stage one was started in 19, stage, 1957, stage two, 1960. And during these contracts, they, they discovered a couple uh, gravel veins during construction where they had to modify the designs, put in cutoff trenches and backfill filter material in these specific locations. And I showed them to you at the beginning. One was on the far right, left abutment and one was in the center, um, but I'll show you again. And then during high pool events at the very beginning, in the initial high pool event, they had a blowout in the filter. The filter was too thin to handle the amount of quantity of water that was going through the esker. So they had to do a bunch of design modifications the first time they filled it. Should have given them a clue. And then uh, in 1984, further down the esker, they had another blowout. And then 1987, further down the esker, they had another blowout. So you can see a, a repeated theme here. So here's the initial design. There was over 200 plus borings. You can see they're pretty much all over the place. Um, here's the original topo. Um, doesn't look like an esker in there just yet, but we'll get there. Here's the original design um, information. They definitely recognize the lake deposits, um, thick deposits, silty sand, um, fine sands on the right abutment were a lake deposit. These sands do not seem to be stratified. Um, and then they had some other, they had some cobbles and stuff like that up on the, on the right abutment stream that they couldn't get through drilling wise. So they knew they had some, and here's the, uh, the section right here. So they knew they had fine sands and gravels over here. Here's the right abutment, here's the left abutment, here's glacial till. So the cartoon is sort of there, but not quite there. Um, they had large, Previous zones um, reported encountered along um, the river alignment during construction. According to resident engineers, gravel vein was encountered during excavations, which would be the right abutment. An upstream spoil blanket and revisions to the downstream filters were proposed to mitigate these additional seepage. The problem is what they encountered was the esker and the, and the, and the porosity of that thing is exceedingly high. So the soil blanket really didn't do anything, and I'll, and I'll show you that. So a lot of the design modifications would work on a normal dam situation, but this was far from normal. So here is the big tell. This is your esker, you can see right here. So this is what they exposed during construction, and these are some of the construction photos when we did the deep dive into the information. This was, um, really analyzed during the uh, 2017 periodic assessment when a lot of these historic photos were drummed up. So here's the random fill. Here's the esker with the stratification. These are all very pervious sands and gravel deposits. And you can see the, the four set bedding, the current was going this way to the left. Here's the river deposit, the old river channel. But um, yeah, just take a look at these beds right here though. It tells you a lot. Very pervious. So here's some of the um, abutment history of repairs for that esker and the permeability associated with it. All the failure modes, all the risk driving modes were all concentrated in the right abutment along this esker due to past performance. All right, um, 1969 pool. In 1970 repairs, first filling, they had to basically re put a berm in here and rebuild and reconstitute the filters. 1984, this whole side here blew out, right, actually right about here, and blew out this way and started moving back this way, eroding back this way towards the water source. 
And so they had to build a whole filter here and put in these horizontal drains. In 1987, the seepage moved down. They had a landslide here. They had to build the Gabion Wall. So you had blowouts every single time where they had fine soils over very pervious soils. And it was the waters going down this way towards the river. Um, in 19, 2011, the high pool here reached levels much higher than anticipated. The Weir Pond was observed to be cloudy. The Weir Pond is right here. So basically, we had some additional discharge and park movement in 2011 during a high pool event. Um, these are some of the high pool reports during these um, observations. You can see a large lens of gravel exposed on a right abutment. I think that was the during um, the problem. Seepage removed about 30 cubic yards of five sand, fine sand. Here's where that was. Oops. This was right over here in the main filters. Right over here. Um, the valley and everything else, everything's running towards the river, is basically what this is saying. Uh, seepage observed on the right abutment, Rockville Slope, adjacent to the right abutment, deposits of medium and fine sand were also observed just above the seepage pool. So you can see a, a history here of repeated, here's, here's the cloudy discharge in that little pool. Um, more piping from larger seeps deposited in the small delta, about 15 cubic feet. Then um, 1987, this is slightly cloudy seepage was observed, observed on the embankment along the seepage pool. So basically you get the same series of distress along the esker. So, the failure mode was determined to be seepage and piping on the right abutment. Piping and seepage problems appear to be due to the existence of inner beds of fine, silty sands and very pervious gravels, which overlay the glacial tilt and bedrock on the right abutment. High seepage pressures anticipated under large events. So you can see some of the, the boulders and stuff upstream in this area. Um, the right abutment also had a, from the 2018, had a, uh, when they did the PA, there's a very large two mile long, three mile delta that terminates right at the river. So they thought that the, that a lot of the seepage was from the, the del delta deposits. They hadn't classified it as esker until we did some more investigation. Oh, hey, oh, there we go. And this is the tail. This is a LIDAR. But after we did a clearance to remove a lot of the, the, the forested deposits here, you can see the esker. It just jumps right out at you. You can see it going right along here. So all the seepage is coming in up here. Their glacial blanket was put in over here. It really didn't do anything because all the entrance paths are up here and it just flows right along here and all the seepage issues were right in here. Here's some of the, the borings in that right abutment. This one looks like an arm with a wish swatch on it. So we thought we found Hoffa the first time we were digging here, but we didn't. Um, here's the left abutment where all the fine sands are. This is one of the uh, original construction photos. And on the left side, when we were walking around site, I started noticing a lot of horsetails down on this road. And horsetails are associated with like wetland environments. And it seemed very weird that they were on a sand slope. Well, that indicated to me that there was a lot of water moving there. And sure enough, not long after that, we had developed a new failure mode on the left hand side through these fine sands. And, it, and the, the whole risk driver shifted to these fine sands because there was no filtered exit. So if the pool got high enough, there was nothing stopping this, this risk driver. What we found on the esker, that the esker, there was no continuous gravel and fine sand layers that went all the way through. You saw the bedding that was repeated and dipping down. That kind of self-filtered everything. But here, we did not have that self-filtering capacity. So um, what we did to characterize this was we started doing a couple additional borings on the left. We did some field investigations with that backhoe you saw and really started realizing that the real problem was not on the right abutment. The right abutment had some scary issues and yes, it was driving stuff, but the left abutment was much scarier. It just hadn't had the pool rises up to that little, you know, elevation to really drive that risk failure mode um, until about 2011 and subsequently since then. But um, so what we did is we went through and we started looking at for low CU sands and comparing and uh, they just started popping up. You can see them all in red here. They're like two, three, four, really low uh, CU uh, coefficient of uniformity. 
just so you know. Um, here's the some of the deliverables we developed. Uh, Jess Rudd is in the back, you can wave. She developed these with the project team, um, and these show gravel percentages. They show above the ground, but really they're below the ground. There was some kind of hiccup there with rockworks. But, and so we were looking at continuity on this side with those graphs. We put everything into a, a relational database system, Rockworks, and we're trying to look for continuity of, of stuff on the right abutment um, and the exit location. And that's what we really did. We tried to layer all the data to look at that failure mode. And that kind of failure mode kind of petered its way out after intense scrutiny. Um, but you can see some of the cross sections that were developed. And then we did cross sectional areas at various parts in the esker to see different potential breakout locations. And then, um, so the site characterization during the IES allowed for a smoother process through dam safety modification study to now, because we really classified the sites. We went through every node in regards to the data and really tried to hone down exactly where the failure modes were gonna occur, what mode was driving the failure mode and how we could reduce the uncertainty. What we found during the process was that the left abutment was really driving the risk through the continuous fine sands and those terrace deposits. And we had to build the case to show that. And the new and the, what the DSMS is, the solution is, is putting a filter trench in the left abutment to cut off those fine sands and a seepage berm to collect so there would be no unfiltered exit. So that is the evolution of that. We're gonna do the little knowledge check here and have any questions. So the knowledge check was, you know, really looking at your failure modes because what you think is driving risk at the end of the day may not be. And that's what we found during this process. Um, that we, we had started off investigating the whole right abutment with a lot of borings, but halfway during that investigation, we realized that we had to start putting borings on the left side because that was really driving risk. So. Questions? We have some people here. They can attend. That we were out in the field with dogs and fun things and having a good time. Um, we did. We had to train a bunch of people on how to log. I, I think our loggers were good, but we had to train the, the drillers loggers. <laughs> no comment. And uh, oh, it was a good time. We're almost done, and it's going to DSMS. One of these days, I'll be able to review the design. I think the design's at thirty percent ish, and it brought down risk. And things are good. Yes. Good question. Was that sand layer uh, in the second part of the spillway? Yeah, the spillway actually, yeah, upstream to downstream, the spillway kind of goes off to the left. And those sands were, yeah, under that. The bedrock was, they, they cleared off a lot of the bedrock, but they didn't clear off all the sand. So they actually put the dam on some sand layers there in the left above it. And they left them and they left the instrumentation there too. The instrumentation, the screens were so high that they had never responded. So everyone just assumed there was no water going over there. But that's, that's not the case. Yeah. In the, so in 1957, do you think the poor site characterization of like not interpreting that was just because there wasn't enough work done in the background or like is that? No, I, I just don't change over time, like our understanding of which will be more. I would just say the Esker was missed. I mean, I, that's the only, they, they assumed it was much more like a uh, fine sands and lake deposits throughout with like var clays, like a lot of other areas of Vermont. But you know, you have an Esker right in the middle that the permeabilities are two to three orders of magnitude higher. So their, their assumptions on all the permeability were just grossly off. The left abutment, probably right. The right abutment, no. Like orders of magnitude, because they blew the screens out. The screens were like 12 inches to 16 inches, and they blew it right into the riprap. Like it didn't even, yeah, on the initial fill. So they underestimated the permeability. We're still getting really weird instrumentation readings off that right abutment that kind of make me scratch my head, but. Going what's down there, it's not that weird. No, but they're they're projecting higher than I thought they would. Okay, yeah. Yes. Can you explain to a non-geologist what the difference between an esker and just regular glacial till is? Yeah, glacial till is like a 
ground up rock flour and stuff that gets rode, ridden over by the glacier. It's in front and it really gets compressed and compacted by like a mile thick ice, you know, it's just a little pressure. But an esker is inside the glacier. It's like at the base where the water's running and deposited materials and then it kind of rides back. It's during the melting process so it doesn't get uh, compacted as much. Yeah, yeah and so so fills will be much more heterogeneous in nature and then esters will be more sorted and graded because it's actually a, a river deposit, fluvial deposit. Where the front one isn't, it's just ground up rock and just pushed, bulldozed into place. It's really dense. Yes. In the historical documentation, was there any opining on the need or the lack of a need for addressing seepage on the left above? Or were they silent? They thought they had removed a lot of the gravel layers over there. That would be the problem in preparing for the, the, the spillway and over to the side of discharge. They thought they removed all the pervious zones and then they removed the one in the cutoff trench. I, I thought that, the, uh, I think they thought the permeability would have been fine to handle. But there was no, there was no real filter over there or anything. So they just, I guess, self filtering. I mean, Brent, you, you started drilling over on the left. I remember that hitting all the till. And then right before the till, you're like, hey, wait a minute, there's this fine sand <laughs> and it's stained. It's kind of orangey. Yeah. So they didn't, the permeability difference was pretty incredible. incredible. And then you were on the right abutment, Jen, and you saw all the different, like uh, the graded bedding and some of, so we had like three sequences. Yeah, upward finding sequences. On the left upstream, you found the same stuff as he did. Yeah, that, and that was upstream on a boring we added at the end. And that was all sand. That was so, that was like sugar. It look, literally looked like sugar sand. Any other questions? Fun dam, I encourage you to visit. It doesn't look quite like it. Well, might, the dam might look the same, but the area doesn't after the most recent flood. Um, Ludlow got hammered. I mean, it's not like the dam, but all the trees are gone. Yeah, the trees are all gone, which looks pretty cool, actually. Yes, yeah. And that's when the esker really jumped out at you. It was when <laughs> it took all the trees down. You're like, whoa, that's an esker. Yeah, both sides. So that's it. That's our story of North Springfield Dam.